Hi, everyone. Okay, so with the cost of living crisis, meaning we're all having to tighten our belts even further at the moment, there's a particular group of women who I hear from a lot who are living in a permanent state of anxiety and concern for another reason. If you're considering or currently going through the divorce process, you may understandably be feeling even more stressed and frightened about the financial implications of divorce and could even be tempted to stay in an unhappy marriage purely for financial security. And obviously this can lead to resentment and huge tension, not just between partners, but the impact on any children that may be living at home. And you know, with that, it can have a lasting and often damaging effect on everyone's mental health. So it's even more important to plan carefully for your immediate and your long-term financial security before reaching a final settlement. And that's why tonight, you know, I was really keen to do this Facebook Live and I'm delighted to be speaking to Neil Russell, who is a partner and he's head of the family department at Seddon's Law Firm. And hopefully Neil's going to be able to offer you some reassurance and guidance on how to cope and plan for financial security during and after divorce, especially, as I said, in this current economic climate. So, Neil, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be back with you all again. I admire the great work that is done by the Latte Lounge and its fantastic organisation. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Neil. And thanks for coming back. Now, for those that may not know Neil, we've done a few Facebook Lives together before. So I'm going to give you a quick bit of background information just in case you didn't catch them. So Neil advises on all aspects of relationship breakdown, including divorce, children and finances. His clients come from all walks of life, from stay-at-home parents to captains of industry, high profile celebrities and owners of family businesses. A career high I know was acting for the Prime Minister Boris Johnson in his divorce, which is actually now a matter of public record. Neil deals with the most straightforward to the most complicated cases involving trusts and international issues. And he has an extensive expertise in advising on prenuptial agreements and habitation agreements. He's a member of Resolution and Pioneer of Divorce Funding. He's known for his pragmatic approach and is respected for his experience and his ability. Neil advises clients on all aspects of the process and assists with ways to deal with the costs involved, using the law to unlock and protect clients' financial interests. In this, he endorses the words of Lord Justice Thorpe, where there is everything to fight for and nothing to fight with. Now, when dealing with children-related matters, Neil regards the children as his invisible clients. His aim is to protect their future through his advice, steering clients towards an outcome that leaves the family best place to move forward following the breakdown of a relationship. And Neil, lastly, is recognised in Legal 500 as being one of the go-to men in the London matrimonial world. And he's also a family law commentator. You may have heard him regularly appearing on LBC Radio on the Family Legal Hour. So, Neil, as I said, thank you for coming back. Now, the last couple of times we spoke, we talked about the actual divorce process, and we also looked at the different sort of financial forms that people need to consider. But as I mentioned in the beginning, there are a lot of women who have perhaps been considering divorce for a while now, or, or, or perhaps are currently in the process, and they are either stalling or putting it off for as long as possible because they're understandably scared or you know about their financial futures so I just wondered whether maybe you could just start by giving some sort of overall advice or and I suppose what the pros and cons of, of staying together are at the moment especially from a financial point of view well firstly the question is absolutely massive what are the pros and cons of staying together and and for anyone embarking on thinking about or flirting with the idea, it, it is massive because there are the emotional consequences and there are the financial consequences, both for husband and wife, mums and dads and children. And sometimes, and more often than not, well, not more often than not, never should any such decision be rushed into unless there is an immediate need to safeguard your finances because money is going to be dissipated or your physical and or mental health is at risk. So firstly, you have to weigh those things up. And quite often, people come and see divorce lawyers, not because they've already made a decision that they definitely want to get divorced, 
but because it's an information gathering exercise because they want to know what the consequences may be. Now, when, when you quite properly refer to the fact that right now we're in a great deal of financial turmoil, the expenses are so much higher, it is, it is, it is, it is indisputable. It is harder to get divorced now if your finances are tight because two households cannot live as cheaply as one because there's going to have to be you know, one property invariably sold to provide two properties. There are issues now with is because, and if you're on an old mortgage with a low interest rate, you're better protected in terms of the repayments compared to if you get a new mortgage. The interest rates, we, we see people with a fixed interest rate of one, one and a half percent at the moment. And their new in their new mortgages, maybe three, four, five percent. So that is a considerable difference just in the mortgage term. So it means sometimes people cannot afford to get divorced straight away. Let me just look, still in the house, utility costs, electricity, gas, water, they've all gone up dramatically. And it's not necessarily the case that two homes will cost the same as one to heat, light and provide water. It's going to be more than twice the amount that's being paid, or at least twice the amount that's being paid at the moment. All of those matters have to be taken into account. Now, it is why sometimes some people are working on their marriages so that they don't have to force deal with the real financial hardship that's going to have to be addressed. I mean, I'm a great believer of people who say get divorced because the grass is greener. Sometimes your own lawn could be greener still because you water it yourself. You know, you look at where you what you've got rather than what may be available. But money is only one part of, you know, rich tapestry of life. There's emotional well-being. For some people, they're just emotionally unhappy in a marriage. And the financial adjustment is is necessary to have a better life for themselves and for the children. You know, divorce is not always the best thing for the children, but staying together in an acrimonious and unhappy home can be even worse for the kids and worse for oneself. And I think, you know, we talk much in the Lassie Lounge, I mean, that's why it was created, to focus on, on our own mental health and well-being. because so often, you know, you get to midlife in your 40s and 50s and you've spent your whole life looking after, you know, if you've got children, looking after your kids and bringing them up or, or your partners, putting your partner's needs first, perhaps, or, or your ageing parents. And and so, it, it, you know, and, and also a lot of women, I'm not saying all women, but a lot of women often have relied perhaps on their partners, you know, to, to sort of take the lead when it comes to finances. And, and so and, and so we, we do hear from a lot of very vulnerable women who just literally don't know where to start. So I thought what would be helpful is, you know, let's sort of, you know, use, I don't want to say the average woman, there is, there is, there is no average woman, but, you know, say you've been thinking about it for a while. Is there a sort of first... I suppose first port, port of call, you know, you talk about that information gathering. Is, is it worth going to a lawyer first and saying, look, this is how I'm feeling? Or, or, or would you recommend first maybe a bit of counselling to see whether actually there are some emotional needs that might actually save it? Big, big, big question again. I could mm. spend hours just answering each question. You know, I'm passionate about helping people and getting people in the right place. And I always say when someone's come to see me, the first meeting is simply information gathering. It's not actually about necessarily doing anything unless everyone's ready to do something. But a couple of points that I'd like to pick up on what you said about first point of call. So many women in particular, particularly if they have relied on their husband to provide for the financial support, think, I don't know where to begin. I don't know what he's got. I don't know what we have. Well, I think it's important to convey that we family lawyers are used to that particular type of client who doesn't know, doesn't understand the finances. So there are ways of unlocking that knowledge and that information so that information is shared. The court process, even if it's dealt with nowadays, we don't look just to run into court because we have alternative dispute resolution. They all require, in any event, for full financial disclosure. So your husband is going to have to provide full financial disclosure. 
it's not as hard as it was. It's not as easy as it was in the old days to hide everything, you know, with money laundering provisions, bank accounts are visible, cash isn't so easy to use anymore. You know, we can unlock and see whether it's Bitcoins, companies, investments in different countries. We can see it all. And even in the straightforward ones, it's not so difficult to find out what the true financial picture is. So don't be alarmed about not knowing. We can find out and provide that information. And that will then enable you to explore and see where the position may be post-divorce. You, you also mentioned about seeing a counsellor. For, for some people, before they've come to see us, they've already been jointly for marriage guidance or for some therapy on, on their own. But I find that emotional journey, which is, is a massive part of the overall journey of divorce, is only one part of it. So if you've had psychological help from a therapist, that's one part. They can't tell you you must get divorced. They may say your mental health is fragile and this marriage isn't good for you. Then you need to know, well, what are the financial consequences? Because are you going to be ready to deal with those financial consequences? And the other thing is people get into a certain space at certain times of people's lives. And I know you at the Latte Lounge look a great deal at the menopause and the impact that the menopause has on life. And now we're looking at it in the workplace. And I think we need to look at it more so at home. I've been doing this for over 30 years now. And as, as we get older and we go through the generations of the decades, you, you, you get more and more experience and you can see where people are at. So many couples end up having issues in their relationships after the birth of a child because of postnatal depression. That is so often not properly understood and or diagnosed. So there are growing differences between the husbands and wives. And we see that again now with the menopause. And I would love if there was such a thing to be able to educate men on understanding about wives going through the menopause. And if, if you know, your Facebook, your Latte Lounge members are struggling with this process of the menopause i'm hoping they're getting the medical help and treatment that they need but they really need to try and explain to their husbands so that they might lock in and get an understanding of what is going on so that they are more tolerant and both tolerant of each other so that things are easier and the other thing in terms of the financial side of a divorce in for people in their 50s or you know, late 40s, early 60s, is people are worried about retirement. And it should be understood that pensions are part of the matrimonial asset that are shared as well with the other financial resources like savings and properties and companies. I think you, I mean, I'd like to sort of just go back and I want to talk about pensions in a minute, but I, I quite like to sort of unpick what you said. It's so true about menopause and men. I mean, we talk about this a lot, that men have to be part of this conversation. I mean, I know from my own experience, and it was over a four year period that, and I had a very strong marriage, but, you know, my personality changed to a point where, you know, my husband didn't recognise me, I didn't recognise myself. A lot of women they lose their, what I call, I suppose, joie de vie. They have no joy, they feel depressed, they're teary, they have no interest in life, in sexual relationships, work, and, you know, and, and their partners don't recognise them and they start to blame themselves as well, or maybe she just doesn't like me anymore and she's gone off me. And I think that's why it's a really, it's really important that before, you know, you do consider splitting up with your partner, that you just make sure that, you know your hormones are balanced and, and that you're you are feeling well and to discuss it with your partner men you're quite right now men need to be educated so they recognize that this is often hormonal as much as circumstance well hopefully not always circumstantial but I think you, know, you picked up on a very good point there look I mean obviously can I, my first, oh, can, sorry. Can I, can I, sorry can I just interrupt on that one point yeah is quite often before Clients have come to see us for legal advice. They've been in marriage guidance. Good marriage guidance counsellors, I would hope, are recognising the signs and or possible signs of postnatal, sorry, not postnatal, men, men, the menopause 
and mental health because it is impacting on mental health and because that impacts on relationships and the other thing i just want to add particularly with women with younger children they're often worried about the labeling adverse labeling if they're taking an antidepressant that it's going to be used against them i always get upset when I then people are scared to reveal the fact that they're on medication and an antidepressant because they think it's going to be used against them or they won't have it because it's going to be used against them or they won't take it. It's not something that will be used against you. It really won't. People go through depression at different stages of their lives and antidepressants help. You don't have to have a fear of the label that it's placed upon you. The family courts will not have, will not deal with you in a less favorable way when it comes to looking after the children equally it may affect your ability to go out to work and you know when we're dealing with maintenance and we're looking at the financial consequences on the breakdown of marriage which we may come on to in more detail in a moment or i can deal with now one of the things the court's looking at are the party's financial resource which includes their income and their earning capacity and it's not just what you are earning when we talk about earning capacity it's what you can be earning and if you're struggling with the menopause, if your mental health is not such that you can go out and work full time or a few days a week because you're suffering, then we need medical support to help and explain that so that you're not burdened with an income that you're not going to achieve because you're not well enough to achieve that at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, you, I, I'd like to pick up on that now because I've just, I'm looking down, not because I'm ignoring you, but I've got a question from a member. That's okay. I've got a question from a member who they are going through the divorce process at the moment, but in her understanding was that everything is split 50 50, but she's suffering with depression, which is probably, she thinks, to do with the menopause. And her other half is being very unreasonable that he expects her to go out and carry on working full time after the split and thinks she's using her low mood as a way of saying, well, no, that's not going to happen. So, I mean, what, what are the actual facts when it comes to, you know, figuring out the finances and especially if she's not well? Right. The, firstly, when we're talking about the assets, we're talking of capital, which might involve property, investments, savings, and, you know, anything of a capital nature. And then there's income, you know, what people earn from all sources. But when we're dealing with, with capital, the starting point is equality. Share it equally, unless there is good reason to depart from equality. And what happened was in 1973, we had the Matrimonial Causes Act, which set out the factors which the court should take into account in determining what the distribution of assets should be. And briefly, they are the income that the parties have, the earning capacity, financial resources, which includes mortgage, the financial needs that the parties have. Now, a mum with two kids or three kids who's going to house them full time might need more accommodation than a dad might need, although it's not so easy to, you know, have the mum factor anymore because mums and dads should be treated more equally in the courts. We look at the standard of living enjoyed by the family before the breakdown of the marriage. Got to recognise that we can't necessarily equate that for two homes because we know it costs more to live in two homes than does one. We look at the duration of the marriage. A short marriage is still a marriage. It doesn't matter how long the marriage is, it's a marriage. But the longer the marriage, the more there is an entitlement for sharing. The party's ages, because that affects retirement and, and pensions. And an important thing is the court looks at any physical or mental disability of either of the parties. Now, mental disability, that's at a time as well as, you know, more permanent or otherwise. So it's, it, it's relevant. The contributions which the parties have made, and it's really important, particularly for mums to recognise that the courts understand that the contribution looking after the home or caring for the family is as valuable as the financial contribution that the husband may have brought in. So you, you could be at home looking after your kids or have done that, and your kids are now going off to university. So you haven't brought in the finances. Your husband may have worked nine till five every day, Monday to Friday for the last 20 years, or he might have worked in the city or as a professional or something earning millions. It doesn't matter. Your contribution is as valuable. 
And it's important that you recognize that. You don't have that fear factor of being a second rate citizen. You're not. The, the, the court looks at the conduct of the parties in very rare circumstances. So conduct is generally not. The court looks at the value of assets that the parties may lose going forward. Pensions, as I said, pensions will be shared. Now, those are the factors that the court took into account. In the year 2000, 27 years after 1973, that statute, we had a case called White and White. And from that point onwards, the parties have generally been looked at as if they were a partnership, hence the equality and need to share the matrimonial assets. And the reasons to depart from that equality are the reasons I've just gone through. Yeah. And I mean, in in so up until very recent days or months, perhaps you used to have to state why you're getting divorced, and now this no fault divorce has come in. It, was that last April or this, or is it this coming yeah. April? Last April. It was last April, sixth of April, two thousand and twenty-two. Yeah. We finally had the long-awaited no fault divorce. Before that, you had to get you had to show that the marriage had irretrievably broken down and rely upon one of five facts: adultery, unreasonable behavior, two years separation with consent, two years desertion, or five years living apart. And bearing in mind most of the time people hadn't lived apart for those two or five years, it was then either adultery, and adultery hadn't always applied or couldn't be proved or wouldn't be admitted. So we ended up with adult with unreasonable behavior. And that was then fault-based. Even when we as lawyers were trying to help our clients, someone felt there was fault. So 5th of April 2022, we now get divorced on the sole basis the marriage has irretrievably broken down. And that's dealt with simply by a statement. You say the marriage is irretrievably broken down. And we can now have joint divorce applications. So there's, both parties do it. There's no fault at all, even if there's one party. And we no longer have a decree nisi, which is the next procedural stage in the process. We now have what's known as a conditional order, but the court will not allow you to have that for 20 weeks. You can't apply for a conditional order until 20 weeks have passed. Then you're not divorced until it used to be known as the decree absolute. It's now known as the final order. And you can't apply for a final order until six weeks after the conditional order. There's a massive great red flag that I want to wave here and say to everybody, do not get your final order until you've got your finances sorted. Yeah. It's really important, particularly because the divorce process is now so much done, so much of it is done online and by parties themselves. Do not risk getting an absolute, the, the final order, until you've got your finances sorted, because it may affect what you can get on the pensions. It shouldn't affect anything else, but it could affect pensions, or it might be some leverage. And if if you're a Jewish couple and you need to get the get, the Jewish divorce, then ideally you don't want to sort everything out until that's also part of any agreement. Yeah. And, and I think for anyone that isn't necessarily able to follow the actual process, after we finish this interview, it'll be saved and, and up on the website. And I will link to my past interviews with Neil, because as I said, the first one was explaining that divorce process. And it's really you know, set out in step-by-step -step guide. And then we looked at the sort of financial papers that everyone, and, you know, circumstances that you would need to look at. So this is, if you like, a sort of a follow-on. I mean, obviously, I think that no-fault divorce has probably helped massively in the last year because I think it just removes one layer of, of you know, <coughs> difficult it's difficult enough. Neil, you mentioned pensions and, and retirement. I mean... Let, let's look at that. I mean, how, what should obviously they be considering, especially those who are, you know, perhaps coming up to retirement age now, or even planning for it, you know, a decade earlier. The, the pension or pensions are an asset like anything else. And the courts have power on dealing with the financial consequences of divorce to divvy up those pensions. So there can be what's known as a pension sharing order, which says that the wife gets 40 percent, 50 percent or whatever the relevant percentage is of that pension. Now, what's really important when you're looking at pensions, particularly if you've been a stay at home homemaker and you haven't worked, 
or you've only worked for a short period, your pension may only have limited value. So you don't have anywhere near enough to retire as the husband then who's been working through the years. But when you look at the number that's given for what's called the cash equivalent value, i.e. what's the pension worth, you cannot and should not necessarily take that at face value. Because what's important when you're looking at a pension is not just what the value of the pension is, but what it can produce by way of return. If, for example, you have, you're married to a consultant doctor who's been in the NHS for many years, or a police officer, or someone who's been in a big FTSE 100 company, or anyone, a teacher, or anyone that's got what's called a final salary pension, the return they will get on that pension is significantly greater than what appears as its value. And we are not allowed as solicitors to advise what we shouldn't do because we'll be negligent if we do is to say well we know what that's really worth and we can tell you what your percentage you should get by way of sharing we use pension experts pension accurate actuaries to assist in working out what the share of pension should be so as to sometimes or often what we want is to provide for equality of income on retirement now sometimes and not untypically a wife might want more equity from the family home in order to reduce the mortgage that she might need to buy her next property or she might need all the equity in the family home leaving the husband with less cash but he's got more pension and what we then refer to as a term called pension offsetting where someone like the husband retains more of his pension in lieu of more cash being given to the wife and again, we need pension experts to equate because we're not comparing apples and apples. We've got apples and oranges. We've got cash now for housing and an orange being the retirement income. You need to look at those things carefully. Otherwise, you're going to find you're not prepared and you're not ready to retire or to provide for your retirement. So pensions are a huge asset to look at. Yeah. Uh, and and also, what about things like maintenance payments? I mean, you know, we have to obviously in, inflation proof them for obviously for the spouse and for the for the children if they are. I, it's below eighteen, is that right? Yeah. Well, for the children, what we're looking at quite often. I'll come onto the inflationary proof at the moment. There are two aspects to maintenance. There's spousal maintenance, which is the maintenance that's paid to the spouse, so to to you, the wife. And there's maintenance, which is paid to you, the wife, on behalf of the child. So that's child maintenance. And the child maintenance is so stereotypically calculated by reference to a child maintenance calculator, which is just done online. So anyone who knows what their husband is earning or roughly what he's earning, they can just type in on Google. We, I even That's how I do it because that's the calculator. You just go to calculate child maintenance. You go to the government website. It's really easy. Even I can do it. And you just fill in the answers to the questions, which are really simple questions. All you need to know is what they're earning and how much time the kids will be spending with their father. And the calculation is done for you. So that's child maintenance. And that can be reviewed each year. The bigger area is on the spousal maintenance, because we don't have a starting point or any arithmetical formula to say, well, like capital, we get half. We don't get half on the income. We may not even get a third. It depends. And it depends on budgets and needs. In, you know, in big money cases, needs are much more loosely and loosely interpreted than the smaller money cases. They're more, they're, they're, they're more definitive because what you're looking at, just I've got a list here in front of me. I'm looking away from the screen because I knew this would come up and I'd forget if I ran through the list without my aid memoir. So just your housing requirements, you've got to look at your mortgage, how much that may cost, interest only or a capital repayment. Your, if you're living in a flat, your service charge and your ground rent, you're looking at your council tax, you're looking at gas, electricity. If, by the way, if you're now living on your own, because your husband has moved out, then you may be able to get a discount because there's only one of you living in the property. We've got to look at your you, you all of the utilities, insurances, buildings, contents, all of those things. Food. Now, I can't remember through my years 
and seeing all sorts of things, how much we're now considering the inflation costs on food. When you can find it on the shelves, because they're going into the shelves and they're bare these days. But food has gone up so much. So when you're looking at agreeing a level of maintenance, we have always in the past looked at either taking it to the CPI, Consumer Prices Index, or the RPI, the Retail Prices Index. The Retail Prices Index includes mortgage. CPI does not include mortgage. And it's difficult to, to say which one you should apply for. A lot of people nowadays, if there isn't a mortgage for them, they will look at the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, because food is going up so much. And what I'm seeing a lot of at the moment are husbands, including those who I'm acting for, or acting again, husbands who are pushing back and say, look, we simply cannot afford to provide maintenance with an RPI or CPI inflationary increase because our income's not going up that much to be able to afford that. So there's a compromise that's often being reached. And I'm not advocating that it should be reached. It depends every case on its own circumstances with a cap on the amount by which the inflation rate will apply. Yeah, and I think we're in uncharted territories at the moment. So I don't think, you know, you could have forecast this sort of pre-COVID and pre-everything else that's going on in the world. But I mean, in our last interview, look, for anyone that's listening to all this, especially if it's someone that's only just considering, you know, divorce or, or separation right now, it probably feels incredibly overwhelming and incredibly frightening. And there's an awful lot to consider. In our last interview, we looked at a sort of creating that sort of detailed future budget. And I, I think, you know, I'd urge people to watch those last two in interviews in particular. I, I've got a question in from a lady who says, and this is no offence <laughs> to you, I'm sure you hear it a lot, but she's frightened to even pick up the phone to her lawyer because she says every time she picks up to ask a question, which, you know, she may, she may just suddenly come to her in the middle of the night. She's obviously worried she's <coughs> going to get ill. And every time she has a question, she... What, so, you know, when we're looking at finances and, and vulnerable, scared women, what, is, is there any halfway house where they can go for that kind of reassurance and information that may not, you know, cost the hourly rate of their lawyer and sort of get them through until when they absolutely need another meeting? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really it's a difficult one because it has to be accepted. The only thing that we can offer and provide is our time and our advice. So therefore, naturally, that advice and time has to be charged for. But equally, I recognise as the member who's asked, you know, how do I manage this? There are efficient ways of using your lawyer and efficient ways of communicating. You shouldn't send three, four emails in a day. Think up the points that you want and ask them by one email or one phone call. Schedule a time sometimes to speak with your questions already listed and prepared because that's more efficient. And also try and get an idea of how your lawyer likes to work so you can find the most efficient way to work with them. They may have some questionnaires that you begin with at the beginning. If you complete a for me, a financial... We only have time and advice to sell, to give, to provide. And it has to be provided at a cost because it can't be otherwise. So the most important thing to do is to try and work as effectively as possible with client and solicitor. So when you're sending a communication to your solicitor by email, try not to send three emails when, when one email will do, because every time they open an email, they've got to open the file, log the email onto this file. And you'll be probably told in the letter of engagement that you're going to be charged for each email sent. So send one. Mm. When you have a communication, when you have a call with your lawyer, try and agree what the course of action is. What do you need to do? What do they need to do? So that there's an efficient process going on. When you're giving documents to your solicitor, I always say to my clients, organize them, put them together as best as you can, because then that's less time at our end, whether it's a paralegal or someone else helping. There are still costs for all these things. So work efficiently. Think about it. But it is important that you do seek to get advice, because if you advise yourself, what you'll find is logic never trumps emotion. Yeah. And therefore, you know, we can give logic when sometimes all you, the client, can give is emotion. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it is, it's a very stressful time and it's very overwhelming and and frightening and, and upsetting. So I think the more organised you can be, the better. I, just very quickly, because I, I want to sort of sign off before I, I risk losing you again. I heard you on LBC, I think it was last week, about the implications of the proposed changes in the law dealing with the financial consequences on divorce. You were talking about what well, you said to me, I was, certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to to stop and wait. Is that, would you like to expand a bit on that? Yeah, firstly, because although we're talking about it in the news and it's made the news because Baron Baroness Deech and Fiona Shackleton, Baroness Shackleton have elevated it that far, it does not mean that this will be seen on the statute books soon and or necessarily at all. Very sadly, for some, it's had a very delayed process through the House of Lords. And I'm not necessarily convinced that the proposed changes will necessarily overhaul it all. We talk about sharing matrimonial assets equally, but then there's the whole issue. What is not a matrimonial asset? To what extent has someone else contributed towards it? I still think we'll have many issues. And so therefore you can't completely avoid it. But I also think that the courts should have a degree of discretion. Although as long as discretion is exercised fairly, arguably in many cases it will do better than a hard set of prescriptive rules mm. that have no variation to tackle and deal with someone's individual circumstances. So don't wait for it because God knows when it will actually happen. I still don't think it will eradicate all issues. And the other thing is, if you're a wife who's going to be receiving maintenance, one of the big debates over the years which this proposed bill is to tackle is what should happen to maintenance. Some years ago, the legislation hasn't changed for 50 years, although there's been tweaks to it, but you could get what's known as a meal ticket for life by some, which is maintenance for life, what's called a joint lives order. So you'll be provided for forever. Nowadays, the courts are looking to enable the less the, the financially weaker party adjust to financial independence. So comes back to their earning capacity. What can you earn? How can you adjust without having to receive income from the, the paying husband in this case that we're looking at now stereotypically? But let me add, under the new legislation, there are provisions. I don't know that this will happen, but it's being proposed that maintenance should otherwise be limited to, say, three years. In Scotland, I believe it's two, but limited to three years unless there will be real financial hardship. So the shift is moving towards limiting the term for which maintenance will be payable. Mm. So there's not an advantage there if you're a receiving party to wait, because things may not get better, they may get worse. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess watch this space. Look, Neil, I mean, obviously, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We could talk for hours. We have done before. I'm hoping this sort of set of three interviews so far, you know, watch perhaps in order will help anyone that is a bit confused or concerned at the moment. Where can, before I let you go for real right. time, where can people find out more about you? And are there any useful resources that you would recommend signposting people to, obviously, other than our own interviews on the website? Yeah, the the, the child maintenance one that we refer to is the government website. I mean, forgive me for saying it, Google is the obvious place. If you stick in your question, you get an answer. So if you want to calculate child maintenance, you stick in that question, you'll come up with a government website, which will tell you how to calculate the child maintenance and give you some information. If you want to deal with your divorce online, you can, how do I divorce online? And, and the, again, the government website will come up and assist. What we haven't spoken about is our, our, our children, and I'm not proposing now to open it all up again, but there are some really good websites that help with parents and children. And just generally, I find, shove in your question to Google and you'll get information. But please be careful because there isn't really a substitute for mm. real legal advice, which is specific to your needs rather than just the general advice that may miss your own personal needs. 
Yeah. And and look, for anyone that's watching this either live now or, or any time in the future, if you want to get in touch with Neil or at Seddon's Law Firm, you can email us hello at lattylounge.co.uk and we can obviously put you in touch with Neil and Seddon's. And if you've got any particular questions that maybe weren't fully answered tonight, or, or in the future again just email us and we will make sure we'll get you some answers the best we can so look neil appreciate you so much again for coming on tonight and all of you for watching generally can i can i just say i always give a warm reception to a latte lounge member so if they call me i'm always happy to try and have an initial phone call to help give some guidance before even coming in you know to the extent that one can but Latte Lounge members are always given that warm welcome. So that's just the reassurance if people want to call. Oh, thank you, Neil. Well, that's amazing. And it is very reassuring. All right. Well, I hope you have a lovely evening. And thanks again to everyone who's watching. Take care and we'll speak soon. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much for having me again.